Those models right now are very focused on existing knowledge, right? So they learned all available public knowledge in the internet, and they were able to produce a result for you that is trying to predict what you're trying to answer. But then there's the question of what about new knowledge? What happens when those models start to hypothesize? They can come up with new ideas, new scientific discoveries. You know, imagine AI coming up with answers to some of the biggest scientific mysteries in the world, like what is dark matter? What's dark energy? What causes Alzheimer's disease? What is quantum mechanics? What is oneself? And that for me is you're moving from a place of those models are amazing in rebuilding and restructuring existing knowledge to coming up with new knowledge. When you start to come up with new knowledge, you're really talking about a whole new frontier. Toma, I am so excited for this. I've spoken to so many of your friends before, so I know an incredible amount about you, and I'm ready. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'm excited to be here. I'm, I'm a big fan of the show, and I'm excited to be on it. Well, that is very, very kind, but I'm fascinated. CPO at LinkedIn, one of my favorite products. How, how did you come to be CPO at LinkedIn, Toma? Wow, that's a long journey. You know, I always think like product journeys are so idiosyncratic and they're so unique. For me, uh, ever since I was a kid, I loved building. I love every aspect of building. I love the entire cycle. I love the problem solving side. I love the design side, technology side. I love the feedback. And it's my place of joy. It's where I'm in a state of flow. Uh, my first experience with cutting edge technology was actually during my army service. And I was blown away seeing what technology can do. But I started my career as an engineer, actually working in semiconductors. Uh, and if you ever worked on a semiconductor as a chief design engineer, it's like it's like you're building you're building a you know a city on the size of a few millimeters. It's it's incredible, and there's a lot of uh, beauty and the complexity in how you build it right. And then I moved to embedded software systems, all the way to starting a company in the consumer space. My journey to LinkedIn was actually a very special one. So I became a LinkedIn fan long before I joined the company. I came to the Valley in 2008. I went to a lecture at the Stanford Engineering School. It was about social networks. Now this is 2008. Social networks is our big deal, but you know they're not as big as they are today. Uh, but they're hot. They're like the hot topic. And all the you know big founders of social networks that you can think about were there. And it was all the rage. The hottest topic was Facebook time spent on the internet. Uh, on stage, there was more of an older uh, founder. His name was Reed Hoffman. This is where I got to meet Reed for the first time. And Reed was different. Reed talked about the power of online professional communities and how it can create economic opportunities. It's the first time I heard it. And it deeply resonated with me. The idea that a professional community becomes a powerful growth engine for the economy just uh, inspired me on a whole new level. And over time, Reed himself became a personal mentor of mine. And it was only several years later, I had a conversation with who back then was the CPO of LinkedIn. And this was early mobile days. And I came from a startup. And if you came from a startup in the Valley, it was all about mobile. And larger companies were still trying to deal with this uh, mobile thing that was happening. And he asked me, he said, how would you re rebuild LinkedIn as a mobile product? I was excited to share my thoughts. Um, and then he said, instead of talking about it, how about you come and build it? And uh, the rest is history. I joined the company in 2012. And in, 2000, in 2020, I became the CPO myself. So it kind of kind of kind of came full circle since then. Can I ask, you mentioned your relationship with Reed there. What would you say is the biggest lesson or takeaway that you've learned from Reed in that relationship? I love my one-on-ones with Reed. Usually I come with an agenda and we somehow find ourselves going very deep on one topic uh, that I haven't even thought about. I, I think of Reed as my, you know, I would come to Reed and I'll say, hey, there is option A and option B and help me think for those. And he'll give me option orange that I haven't even thought about before. And it's highly philosophical. It's it's really deep. It's really insightful. So most of the time, we we kind of stay at this level of of insights and uh, profound understanding of needs and talking through those versus the details of of the product itself. I, I come a lot for read when there's a really complex problem I'm trying to solve or I'm trying to be inspired with a whole new way of thinking. Uh, that's kind of my source of uh, 
of product inspiration in many cases. I love that. Always an outside the box thinker. I do, I do have to ask you, and I, I ask quite unfair questions because they're generic, but I, I'm fascinated on this one always, which is like when we think about product today, especially given your experience working kind of within semiconductors, within consumer, and then also kind of like incumbent LinkedIn style, like do you think product is more an art or a science? And if you were to put numbers on it, attach it to them, where would you put it, Toma? So <laughs> I heard you ask this question on a previous podcast I listened to, and I must say it created some tension for me because I, I think it's impossible to delineate science mm -hmm. from art. I think they're interwoven. They play off each other. There's a lot of science in art. Like my daughter, my 10-year-old daughter loves art. And now she's learning about scientific principles of geometry and color theory. And there's a lot of art in science. Some of the best scientists in the world are very mm -hmm. imaginative. But after I kind of uh, thought about it more. I think when we talk about science in product, I think there's a tendency to think about it more as the best practices of product, the skill set. How do you lend, you know, the know-how around design and data and experimentation and business? And that for me is a foundation of what it means to be good at this job. And honing that craft, the scientific part of it in quotes, can take you a long way. And it has to be applied learning, right? You, you can't sit in a classroom learning how to do product, you have to build. But I think what sets you apart in the craft of building product is your ability to bring vision and creativity and intuition and the judgment and the imagination. I talked about my interaction with Reed. I think that's what sets you apart from the group. It's where you listen to customers or users or you just observe them. And some would just go up and say, oh, this is what they want. And some would come, I think this is what they need. It's that like, you know, uncovering profound needs that, they haven't even talked about. It's being able to anticipate uh, where technology is going, where the industry is growing, because you kind of see a few steps ahead. And that that takes a lot of intuition and imagination. And I think the further you grow in your career, there is an expectation that that's what you'll bring to the company. The best product people that I enjoy working with have this combination of knowledge and creativity. They can do vision. They can go all the way to execution. And when I think about the intersection of uh, product people who are dreamers, who are doers, who are learners, you really get the holy grail of, of uh, product craft and ability. I have two questions I just have to ask off the top of that, which is like Shreyas Doshi actually says a brilliant thing, which is like, there's three types of profiles in product. There's the visionary, which would be like your Tony Fidel, big picture thinker, like just fucking vision beyond belief and inspiration mind. Uh, then there's the craftsman. Uh, and then there's the operator. The kind of craftsman is kind of the in-between of the visionary and the um, and the operator. And the operator is like your scaled CPO, where bluntly they instill processes. They're kind of the professional CPO that puts processes and infrastructure in place. Which would you say that you are of the three and would you agree with those characterizations? I think those attributes of what's expected in the role uh, in the role are correct. Um, and I think it's hard to find somebody who is locked immediately at the center. Uh, this is one where I would send you to my team and people who work with me and say, I would, you know, curious to say what they say. You know, talking about myself, I, you know, if I go back to why I love building, I love all three attributes. So I can tell you what I love doing, but sure. I let others tell you what I'm good at. Um, I love the imaginary side. I love the vision side. I love getting excited about what the change we can create in the world if we build something pretty unique. But then I love taking it all the way to how we actually execute on it. I love the grind of the work itself. So I don't stick around with just a, you know, a great whiteboard session. I love seeing it in action. I love feedback. I love seeing how, how you can take something that, you know, most launches are never zero to one. They're like zero to 0 0.6. Yeah. They're never great. And like moving it from 0.6 gradually to really finding product market fit. That's an incredible feeling. When I had my startup, knowing that somebody's using something you built from scratch and something you invented is an incredible experience. It's, it's one that I can tell you, I can see if you love product or not, if you get excited by it. For me, it's less about, uh, you know, you have a lot of people who are coming to product to make decisions. I don't think to think of those as the right product people. I think it's inherently in the love of building and 
trying to create change. It could be change on a small scale or a bigger scale, but it's the love of building for it. You said about that, like loving seeing people engage with your product. How do you, and you mentioned earlier about kind of bluntly that ability to think ahead of your customers in some ways. How do you think about when to listen to your customers versus when to pursue your own roadmap and think ahead of them? What, what does that decision making look like? Yeah, ideally, your roadmap is is always inspired by what you, I'm going to say, intuitively learn from customers or listen to customers. Uh, I'm a big believer in the notion of the job to be done. And a lot of it is how do you build strong conviction and belief without having evidence yet, without having data yet? Um, and I think it goes back to the idea that if you want to innovate, uh, it has to be rooted in some deep insight. And that how, deep insight can how, come how from... Do you, how do you do that? Uh, so uh, there's a craft to that as well. There's a science and there's an art. Uh, but um, if you go back and you really believe that like, in, in order to develop innovative products, you have to have a profound understanding of an unmet need you're trying to do. The job to be done way is just a way to contextualize it. So for example, at LinkedIn, we have many audiences. We have people who come to LinkedIn to... Uh, to partner, to find a job, to hire, to uh, get input on knowledge, to share their knowledge, to market, to sell, to start a company. Like there's so many jobs to be done that can be done. That was the kind of the profound insight that Breed had was if I help people build their community in a professional way, there's so much value they can drive from it. It really depends on what they're trying to achieve. So we used to focus on the audiences at LinkedIn and that was helpful in segmentation but it wasn't helpful for innovation. And then we moved a few years ago to really trying to humanize the need, asking, for example, uh, what are members truly looking for, not just functionally, but also emotionally. And I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, B2B buying, buying B2B products. You can think of it as a very boring, you know, uh, uh, great job. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to look at a few products. I'm going to compare their pricing and limitation. I'm going to compare the scalability of them, the criteria of them. It sounds in a way um, very functional, almost like a spreadsheet kind of task. But when you buy a B2B product, it's actually a highly emotional, stressful job. Because if you're going to buy a, a widget for a company, for your company that's going to cost $50,000, $100,000, a million dollars, and it's going to take months to implement, you better know what you're doing. You better do a good job. It could, you know, it could be a career-ending decision for you. So what happens with buying B2B product is that they usually, all they want is consensus. They want people to agree with them that this is the right product to buy. Uh, it's a highly emotional job. It's a really stressful job. You're trying to get people to agree with you in the company. It's almost like a committee, unofficial committee you assemble, people who agree with you that this is the right product to buy. So it's not about the features. It's really about getting your peers to align with you. It's a social job that uh, you can actually get this done. Another example is people who create on LinkedIn. A and you and I just talked about it right before the session a little bit. But, you know, creation on LinkedIn is very different than creation on other platforms. If you come to LinkedIn expecting the same dopamine rush you get from Facebook or Twitter because of the likes and views, then I don't think you're thinking about the LinkedIn platform correctly. The job to be done for creating on LinkedIn is really driving opportunity for you. It's the quality of the views. It's the audience you're reaching. It's the ability for you to build a pipeline for your venture or... Uh, your gig, people are interested in your insights, they want to invite you in. And actually what we hear, we have programs that we work uh, closely with creators and we had a creator, it actually started with some early creators and we found that 50% of them in the span of a month after creating on LinkedIn were getting reached out by people who were saying, hey, maybe you can do a session with my team, do a workshop on your craft, on the things you're talking about. You can do, they're basically getting economic opportunity as a result of creating on LinkedIn. That's very different than other platforms. We don't do ref share. Your opportunity of LinkedIn is your voice. It's what you create. It's your reputation. It's your brand. The job that we've done is inherently very different. So, you know, going all the way back to the notion of understanding what is it that people are trying to do is 
like understanding well beyond the functional role, but also the social and emotional role are extremely important to the context of your product. You mentioned there that the buying decision and actually kind of the influence that one has. I'm too interested. I had Glenn Coates on the show, who is, uh, who is VP of product at Shopify. And he said that the day that the founder is no longer the CPO is the day the company stops innovating. Is that fair? I think the context of the company matters a ton. It really depends on the stage. And, you know, founders, in my opinion, I, I love founders. Uh, they're a critical part of every life cycle of the company because they intimately carry the original vision. They have that birthing insight that made the company, and that's invaluable. Uh, now, some of the best companies in the world that their founders do not play an operating role, like Microsoft or Intuit or Netflix right now or Amazon, uh, the founders are still playing a guiding role. So they're still there for you know Bill Gates at Microsoft, Scott Cook at Intuit. Uh, Bezos at Amazon. And those are very successful companies. You know, Apple still has the spirit of Steve Jobs, but obviously he's no longer there. So I think it really depends on the stage of the company. Personally, you know, working when I joined LinkedIn, Reed no longer had an operating role. He was our chairman of the board, but I spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with him. Um, so I think it's having the founder as part of the company and always laddering up to that, uh, that founding insight. I like to think that companies have founding moments, and it's more than one. If the company is successful, LinkedIn is going to be 20, year, 20 years old in a month from now. Uh, actually, in a couple of weeks from now, we're going to be 20 years old. And I think the company went through multiple founding moments. Now, if you take it all the way back to a startup or a young company, then yes, I would be very worried if the founder is not intimately involved in the product, either as the head of product or playing a key role in shaping the product, because ultimately it was that founding insight that played into it and it better be shepherded by the founder. But if you, if you think of a company evolving with multiple founding moments that are still shaped by the original vision, then you have a more expensive way to think about the role of a founder. And I think it's becomes a lot more in spirit and guiding than in operations. Toma, we chatted before about content creation on the platform and how much I loved it. I think the shows are also successful because I'm also quite honest, more so now than I have been before. Can I ask a blunt question, which is when you look at the desktop site and you look at the mobile app, do you not feel that it feels outdated from a UI perspective? I think there's a lot that we can do there to improve. And there's that actually we're working on right now to really innovate within the constraints of what we've done. In fact, once you start playing with the app itself, there is a lot of innovation in between the feed and we can go deep on the feed and the role it's playing today and within the messaging experience, within the search experience. In fact, the use case of LinkedIn dramatically evolved over the last few years. But I do feel like in many ways, the current experience does feel, it constrains us and there's a lot we can do to improve it and, and, and to rethink it. And that's what's happening right now in a world of generative AI right now, there's a lot of complexity you can potentially unwound uh, by building a simpler experience, but playing AI into it. If you play the last six years for us at LinkedIn as a company, there's been tremendous evolution in the product that led to some pretty remarkable results. Revenue for LinkedIn more than tripled, our member base more than doubled, our engagement is reading record levels, and I mentioned we're about to hit 20 years old uh, company in a couple of weeks. We're growing the fastest we ever grew right now, which is pretty remarkable for a 20 year old company. What do you put that down to? Yeah, I think there has been a lot of work back to the vision. I think we've been very centered around what we're trying to do at LinkedIn and how it connects to our vision to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. That's always been our true north. I think in the last couple of years, I credit a big part of it, not all of it, but a big part of it to our focus to leading with clarity to principles and conviction. Uh, personally, I love to tell my team that we might be wrong, but we're not confused. Uh, I see a notion of clarity of thought and clarity of execution as being critical for creating a culture of innovation and operational excellence. And it goes all the way from having a, a deep understanding of, of the problem we're trying to solve for. And if you okay, understand that really, really well, yeah. 
if we if we go deeper though clarity of vision you know you might you might be wrong but you're not confused let's go deeper what is driving the growth is it the feed is it the newsletters is it messaging where where is the clarity that is driving growth so I think if you look at LinkedIn, ultimately it comes down to when I open the app, I'm able to uh, make progress as my job to be done. And it could be that I'm coming in and I see Harry Stevens on my feed and I learn a new insight and I want to follow what he says and I want to follow the people he talks to so I can learn more about my craft and be better at it. But at the same time, it could also be, we know whenever I need to go to LinkedIn because I'm about to meet somebody, I can get the insights I need to have that interaction, but be more deeper, be more meaningful. And we all meet people on a regular basis. So ultimately, the feed, the messaging, those are just constructs to help you accomplish your job to be done. But I think it starts with that clarity on what is it that you're trying to get done. So we know that people come to LinkedIn, they come to the LinkedIn feed, they're trying to find ideas, advice, inspiration. They're trying to see what their network is up to so they can start continues to build relationship. And those out ladder up to a job to be done, they have. So it's not a specific area of the product. It's the experience that allows you to fulfill your needs. Can I ask an interesting one, which is like, I think, you know, both TikTok and Facebook have realized kind of the decaying utility value of social graphs for them and moving to kind of content recommendation engines. You mentioned that advice, inspiration, motivation of posts. To what extent do you think you're moving to to the content recommendation engine over the social graph component? I think the social graph for us has been a phenomenal construct for you to be able to almost like, you know, tell us who are the people that you find most valuable in your network, in your career. And again, your network is how you get things done in your professional life. That's the founding insight of LinkedIn. So that will never go away. Being able to say, those are the people that matter to me, those are my colleagues, my customers, my clients, the people in the industry I want to learn from, that's a, a really key part of, of going to be your LinkedIn, let's call it, you know, conversational experience, not just the feed experience, because the feed could be constraining as a, as a mental structure. The, having said that, uh, I think the idea of being able to go more to topical recommendations and being able to find people who are outside of the people you know but they matter tremendously to your craft is extremely important. So I could be an AI engineer in the field of agriculture right now and say, who are the best AI engineers working on crop development uh, systems? And I might not know them personally, so they're not part of my network, but being able to follow them, to learn from them, could actually change the trajectory of my career. I can do a much better job. I can, in, how do you think about utility value of connections? You mentioned that I might not know them, but I can follow them. I probably get 200 connection requests a day from people I don't know. How do you think about like how much value a connection actually means today, given that awareness? So it's a great point because I think that's one that it took us uh, quite a while to solve for members. We started with just connect as a construct because it was about people you knew that were part of your network with the idea that you can reach out for help and uh, they're willing, there's a kind of a bi-directional desire to help each other. Uh, and then we introduced the idea of following people quite later in the role. And we, we never did a great job clarifying the role of those. And I think we are right now, but um, I think that led to people building networks of people they don't necessarily know really well, but they love to learn from, which would be a follow relationship. So for example, now when you go to the product, uh, we would suggest that you follow people who are not necessarily, um, co we don't necessarily think you have a relationship with. Like if you went to the same school together, same year, you work at the same company in the same years, we might suggest you connect. But if not, we'll suggest you follow people. And, and that's something we're continuously working. Actually, follows right now is one of the most impressive growth trajectories at LinkedIn. It's growing a 200% year over year. There was no for a billion follows a while back or so. It's been grown a lot since then. But it's really honing down that there's two kind of modalities of relationships on LinkedIn. There's the, your network that you're willing to help and get help from. And there is the uh, following modality, which is, uh, I would love to learn from you. You share incredible insights. Do you think we need a refresh though? Because like, I have 5,000 connections. I'm not that connected, Toma. 
despite my desires. Do we need a refresh of connection utility value? Well, 5,000 is well connected. Um, but I think in many ways, I think when it comes to rebuilding the network, I think, yes, a lot of people are actually going and they're, in a way, cleaning it back to the people that they are uh, they know in terms of the network. But ultimately, it's hard to do. It's not something that most members would enjoy doing and going and cleaning your network. So what we're trying to do is emphasize the ones that we know there's a strong connection strength with. Mm. Uh, people you interact with on a regular basis. People that... When they reach out to you, you know, you respond. Uh, there's a bi-directional relationship. That's the idea of connect. Yeah. Uh, so we're trying to do that a lot in the product itself for relevance. Can I ask you, you mentioned that I loved a comment you said, which is, you know, I may be wrong, but I'm not confused. Like when I invested in Pakistan uh, and lost a lot of money, I was wrong, but I wasn't confused about making the investment, which maybe I should have been. Um, what is something when you think about product you've been wrong on, but not confused on? And what did you learn from that? Yeah. So taking a step back on being wrong, but not confused is uh, my notion is if you're confused, then only luck will save you, right? It's like there is there is very little chances you'll be successful, but you have conviction and you kind of rally around that conviction. Yes, you might not be successful. You might be wrong, but ultimately you have clarity and focus. And that for me are critical critical for execution. Um, so it starts with clarity of thought about the problem you're trying to solve and goes all the way to the clarity on the solution with some strong principles. But ultimately, if you get those done really well, even in your you know, example of Pakistan, there's clear learnings from it because you had a very specific hypothesis to why you were trying to do it and interact with it. I think for us, I'll give you an example of one that we were not confused about, but we were wrong. And we and actually, it was not rooted in a job to be done. So we can actually show how those come together. You know, stories at LinkedIn, we launched stories uh, a while back, and it was a short uh, test in many ways. But we launched stories because we, we, we thought that we can basically unlock more creation on LinkedIn by allowing for ephemerality to play a role. So we would sometimes hear from people that they're, you know, not, they think that it's sometimes risky to share on LinkedIn because their boss is on LinkedIn, their colleagues are on LinkedIn, their customers are on LinkedIn. And we thought ephemerality might alleviate uh, that concern. And we launched it and we saw some, you know, pretty, I would say, mediocre performance. Uh, it was far from uh, the unleashing of sharing that the team thought uh, they would get. When we did follow-up sessions with members, and we were clear about what we were trying to achieve. We thought ephemerality specifically would unleash more sharing because it would alleviate the concern around sharing on LinkedIn. When we did follow-up sessions with members after that, it was clear that we completely misunderstood the job to be done for creators on LinkedIn. It wasn't about uh, wanting things to disappear. It was almost like the opposite. People wanted things to last on LinkedIn. When people share on LinkedIn, they wanted to be seen. In fact, they want to attach it to their professional identity. They want to feature it on their profile. It's that strong. And that was kind of a complete, honestly, it was a, a really big uh, groundbreaking insight for us because we started doubling down on the role of creation as part of your identity. We also learned that when they share on LinkedIn, yes, everybody enjoys their likes and views. It's part of the chemical response you get in your brain. But what they appreciate most about LinkedIn versus other platforms, it's the reputational part. It's the opportunity. It's been able to showcase my values. That's very different than any other social platform. How important is being the first? I had Alex Schultz on from Meta, uh, the head, uh, CMO at Meta, and I asked him this question, but how important is being the first? You mentioned stories, you know, Facebook obviously followed Snap and Snap followed Cacao. And there's always like who did first, but how important is being first in product release? I don't think it's first to launch. I think first to launch is not the right concept. I think there is a halo effect of who is launching first right now, you know, at, at some times. And sometimes you would see product managers, you know, getting really excited about the launches that they've made. But for me, that's, that's not interesting, the launches. I think it's first to product market fit that is amazing. If you're first to product market fit, you you build an amazing uh, leg up in terms of both insights and momentum and speed. 
so when we look at stories, we've got Snap, like product market fit first. And like LinkedIn were very far behind in like race to product market fit on stories. Do you think that was a core component as well? Um, I don't think it's the same dimension because we were not trying to compete with Snap. We were trying to see if that format of stories uh, would allow for better creation and better way to express yourself on LinkedIn. I think what we saw with stories that there was a construct that people bought around, you know, people were really excited about expression that worked really well in Instagram, in Snapchat, uh, works really well with shorts um, as well. And it, um, you know, that kind of, you know, the evolution from there to TikTok and so on. And uh, for us at LinkedIn is the question is, is that format conducive for professional knowledge sharing? Mm -hmm. So that was like a test we were trying to, to do, but it, I don't think it was the notion of being first to the market that made it special. At least not for us. You mentioned like the data not being amazingly exciting. And I just wanted to ask, how do you know how much data is enough to make a decision? Post a launch, you know, is it two weeks of data where you're like, okay, we see the writing on the wall. Sometimes it just takes longer. Like we said before the show about consistency of content creation. How do you know post product launch when enough data tells you the answer versus when you need more? Yeah, I, I always like to start with before you launch, before you even start building, what is success? Like, like you know, once you launch it, what should be going up into the right that I should be excited about? Um, don't tell me in retrospect because, you know, then you're just trying to fit the data into what you're trying to do, but tell me ahead of time. And it's okay to, again, you might be wrong, but not confused, just have a strong opinion around it so we can see if we're building towards the intuition we have. I think for me, it's it's there isn't a notion of enough data. Is that the hypothesis you have isn't being validated? Like ultimately, you have success with a product when you have real adoption and retention. People actually find product market fit. They're coming back to the product to engage with it. That's when you know you really have something. Uh, and adoption by itself, you know, if you have large enough base, could also be. Uh, in a way, a gamed in a while because discovery is really strong and you can always get people to try out something. But will they stick around? Will they come back to use it? That That is your real test. We do a lot of processing around the notion of evidence versus conviction. You can build something with strong evidence that you had before or you can build it with conviction with a hypothesis of showing evidence at a certain amount of time. And ideally, over time, you start showing evidence to what you have. But some of our biggest uh, bets we've made, for example, investing in skills as a way to connect the talent marketplace, uh, started with some big, bold bets around um, idea of conviction. We believe, for example, in the case of skills, that we can close the skills gap that happens in the economy by investing a lot more in helping people showcase and demonstrate their skills and create better matches for companies. And if you look at the talent marketplace, talent marketplace has been built on pedigree and experience and not necessarily on the skill set you have because that was not easy to measure and uh, there's heuristics to how you connect the marketplace. So, and then over time, we started measuring, are we doing uh, a good enough job there? Are we seeing enough validation for the early hypothesis to invest more and more and more? So it's, it's really a gradual incremental process that starts with conviction when you don't have enough data but ideally, you come back with data to showcase the responses again. And speaking of that conviction and data, I do want your advice. Product reviews are so core cool to all product teams and to all companies. How do you do product reviews? How often do you do them? Who's invited? Yeah, so we do multiple product reviews every week. It starts um, each quarter. We actually kind of review all of our big rocks, our big investment areas across the product and the business. And then uh, we determine what do you want to see as a product team coming in. And for that, I decide what's the products I want to, you know, cover for review. By the way, for context, I don't call them product reviews. Uh, I call them product jams, and there was a very specific reason for it. Uh, we used to call them product reviews, and people used to see it as a, a way to get almost like a, you know, a, um, a, you know, a pat on the back for whether it was a good product review or if you got feedback, it was a bad product review, and it really uh, took away from building a great product. So, in a growth mindset notion for me those 
uh, sessions are all about feedback. So I changed it to be product jams. And what I tell the team is, you've put your best thinking forward. You know, you worked hard on the product, you worked hard on the thinking, you worked hard on the design. Now you're putting it to the team. And our goal as a team in this meeting is to make that thinking better, is to make that product better. So the only currency really is feedback. And what's nice about this team is you really have kind of this 360. You have the team presenting. They provide that local expertise. They're the one who are recommending a solution and they're highlighting a problem. You have my team, which is the product executive team, which is uh, they cover the whole business. So it's multiple areas of the business coming together. It's a very broad. Uh, you have cross-functional leaders who can provide other perspective. So by the time the meeting is done, they're getting some pretty diverse, deep feedback from multiple areas uh, of, of the product. And that allows for that deep thinking to really come uh, to come to it. Do you see a difference in product review discussion quality and feedback quality when comparing remote and online versus in-person and whiteboarded? I do. I actually do my product jams in person. I, I feel there is an energy of creativity and discussion that you get in the room in person. It's You can do it remote as well. It's There's no... It's not that remote does not work, but I think there is an edge to doing it on a whiteboard, discussing, opening, pointing, having freeform conversations that allow for that creativity and discussion to be a lot more natural. So I move my product jam sessions to be in person. Uh, and with COVID, we moved them to be obviously remote because there was no other way. But once we came back from uh from uh, COVID, uh, we moved it to be in person. And across the room, people will tell you the energy levels are just higher. The creativity, the ideation, the velocity of discussion just uh, is elevated to a whole new level. Who sets the agenda and who's invited? So I said the agenda for the quarter in terms of what I would like to see as the product areas being covered. And we have a structure for the for the, for the session itself. So you start with the problem definition, ideally as articulate and nuanced as possible. You share your job to be done. What is that insight that leads your work? And then you share your principles. If those are there, that's already a great session. And then ideally we spend most of the time on the demo. We go over the product itself. What are your principles? So if the job to be done is um, lower amount of spam, say on site, what are the principles? Uh, what, what would that be? Well, the principles are basically your opinionated approach for how you would solve the problem. They ideally have teeth, they have trade-offs. So if your goal is to alleviate the amount of uh, spam or bad activity on the platform, at the cost of what? So for example, uh, usually there is a, there is a, a trade-off between trust and growth, hmm. right? Because you want to allow for a lot more growth in the system, you want to reduce friction. When you reduce friction, you also allow, allow usually for bad activity to engage as well. And the more friction you have to alleviate bad activity, you also sometimes alleviate, you know, you also take down good activity. So there is kind of always that there's usually a trade off between the notion of engagement and growth with trust. And when a, an idea for Lily, you find a great way to build an efficient frontier where you have high growth and high trust going together. For me, the principles is that. Uh, the product leader for that area comes with an opinion approach of how they will solve it. And they're stiff to it, right? They're basically making an opinion about how they solved it and what's the trade-off they're going to make to actually solve it in a great way. So once you have that, you can actually react to something really, really well. Another example is, you know, when we look at the business side of the product, like for example, if we build, think about our marketing solutions product, our advertising product, uh, one of the strong opinions, which was we solve for ROI. We don't solve for revenue. So when we optimize the system, we optimize the system to double down on ROI in the marketplace, ROI for advertisers, being able to see the value versus LinkedIn trying to monetize. And the belief was if we show ROI for customers, they'll naturally come back and spend more money. And that was like one example of a principle that really changed how the product worked. 
when you have, you know, bluntly this structure and you have a lot of ideas thrown around, you also have to make decisions and you have to prioritize. When you come out of a product review, how do you prioritize what to do, what not to do, and what's a luxury but next quarter? So if we just finished a great product jam, um, then what happens is there's tremendous amount of feedback being shared. As I mentioned, the only currency for those from here is feedback. Usually the way I end the meeting is I summarize the areas that uh, we covered and where I would like to see progress on. I try to make sure it's between one to three, so it's not the whole list. Uh, and then the working team, we have a, a, a new process we started uh, a, a while back, which is called Briefback. The team itself, which presented, they send a summary of the session with the feedback and all the key action items they have and the ETAs for the key areas they're going to work on. So it's really up to the team presenting to take that feedback and act on it. And we literally have those sessions. That really allows for clarity in execution. Back to the point we talked about before, we don't leave a product jam without clarity of what's the next steps and what's the changes you will make as a result of it. But it's really up to the team leading it to go and do it and follow up on it. How, sorry, I'm mentioning that. How do you think about effective accountability? I always worry that when it's spread across multiple people, the accountability mechanism weakens. How do you instill that accountability across multiple parties? Well, we have a clear definition of roles and responsibilities. I think to the point around, we might be wrong, but not confused. When you have clarity of execution, you also have clarities on roles and responsibilities. So we have a process of for example, who plays the role of the recommender? And that's like the expertise, the team with the most expertise. Who uh, is potentially has, we call this the A, the approver, who can approve a specific decision or needs to approve a specific decision. Um, that could be everything from our trust team to teams that have you know, an, an objective which could potentially come in conflict with the other team. And then there is a person who is the D, who has the decision. So whenever there is an escalation, or a disagreement, we try to solve it really quickly with one person. It's a person on the team. It's always a person that has the decision on um, how to resolve the situation. So ideally for every situation, there's a lot of clarity about what role that everybody play. And when you think about product teams in general, there's a product manager, there's a designer, there's an engineer. So we have clarity of roles and responsibilities there as well. I'll have to get to a point where Everybody owns the product because ultimately that's the value that the company delivers, but there is clear delineation between when it comes to make a decision, who plays what role. And I think that's what we have here um, with a great uh, clarity on LinkedIn. Toma, what's the most controversial product decision you've made? If I go back, the feed at LinkedIn, um, you know, now in hindsight, doesn't seem controversial, but at the time it was very controversial. So uh, just to give some context and maybe to take a step back, there's a lot of discussions usually about zero to one product and people that are launching and how to scale product. There aren't many conversations about minus one to one product, product that we're not doing really well. And there was a turnaround story. And for me, the LinkedIn feed is a good example of that. Uh, LinkedIn was actually one of the first social platforms to ever have a feed. But it was more of an activity feed. It was a connections feed, the jobs updates feed, the profile views feed. In 2015, for the first time, we assembled a feed team at LinkedIn. And we focused on creating an experience which is all about professional conversations. Now, again, that sounds you know, clear in hindsight, but back then that was not a thing at LinkedIn. Uh, the feed was really a promotional feed for teams to showcase their products. So you know, the growth team would show people you should, you know, you should connect with. And the jobs team would show jobs you might be interested in. And everybody was using the feed as a promotional way to show members um, recommendations about that they can do across LinkedIn. But there was no opinion that the feed was about professional conversations. And uh, the first change I, I made there was that the feed was first and foremost about people that matter to you, talking about things you care about. The feed belongs to the member. It's not, a, it's not an organizational chart. It's we start from the member's job to be done. And I can tell you internally, that was a controversial decision because the feed was already used by multiple teams. 
uh, as a way of discovery. Many teams relied on the feed as a way for them to drive discovery for the product. That was a pretty big pivot internally and externally. Is that and an, is it that was an actually a dilemma yeah. question. Is it where you've got to cannibalize your existing product with a new product? That's would you hundred percent in, in ter- yeah, because internally it was it the feed was a, a massive discovery engine for so many products at LinkedIn. And it was a revenue engine for so many products at LinkedIn. And in a way, for actually for many companies, it was their main discovery channel. So then comes this, you know, um uh not confused by, you know, not confused what might be wrong product leader and says, I'm gonna change it. I'm gonna change the core of how this works. And you know, there was high conviction there and I had to show evidence along the way, but that was a highly controversial uh, decision early on. And gradually, as we showed evidence, you really got to a point where you raised all boats. You got people to start using the feed, see it as a place that can actually have professional conversations. And over time, all of those products benefited. But at the beginning, it was a little bit of, um, I to create space for growth, I have to start trading off some of how we used to be doing things in the past so I can change it to how we do things in the future. Um, and, and, but, and the feed is a, a great example because there's so many inflection points. You know, what, when we started doing that, one of the things we saw was also we drove, after we started orienting our professional conversations, we start seeing virality take off. And we saw strong engagement and virality. But we also saw some shallow engagement and you know, bad actors starting to use the feed as a way to drive clickbaits and and spam and memes and stuff like that was coming into the feed. And we made that was not controversial at LinkedIn, but it's controversial from a product standpoint. We made a core decision to curtail growth, even at the expense of uh, engagement that we've never seen at LinkedIn growing at such record levels, to make sure we go back to the drawing board and we focus on trust and quality. I'm saying it was controversial at LinkedIn because we always make trade-offs to make sure we build with quality uh, over uh, shallow growth. But this was one where the product was just taking off. When the product is taking off really well, people tend to get intoxicated, but you know, they get to be really attracted to the notion of numbers and metrics going up to the right. So the decision to stop it at its kind of you know, hockey stick level and say, let's go back to the drawing board and we're gonna build this differently so it's professional conversation and it's quality conversation. I can think about it as a, usually it's a controversial decision outside of LinkedIn, but inside of LinkedIn, that was actually very straightforward to do. I, I think we should do an internal review, me and you here, where I say a feature or product and you can give me a rating out of 10 on how you've done, okay? So if we start on feed, what would you give your rating out of 10? You know, for me, it's always an evolution, right? So I, I and I would always, uh, I would always uh, score myself harshly. I think we still have a long way to go. I think we're far from building the product that we know we can, which is all about knowledge exchange and the ability for you to find every session for you would be remarkable. We do know, I, I can give you an example for what an incredible experience looks like and what I want to build for every member. An incredible experience looks like when you come to the feed and you find an insight that can help you in your day. And we know because we get it from members who actually have this experience. Um, and they engage with the feed in a remarkable, remarkable way. And they are able to find insight that goes through their work. They're able to connect with people they haven't seen in the past. Uh, they're able to really use the feed as a source of wisdom that they use in their daily jobs. And on the flip side, as a creator, you really build your business for the LinkedIn feed. You build your reputation, your brand, you build opportunity. So this is happening for millions of members. I want to make sure it happens to all hundreds of millions of members of LinkedIn. So we still have ways to go there. Toma, I, I, I love you. You ever asked a founder what their revenue is? And they go, ba, 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 ba. And you're like, nope, it's a number. It's a number, baby. <laughs> what, what would you give the out of 10? Then the feed. You agree that you've done very well. You like an eight out of ten, a ten out of ten, a, a four out of ten. What do we feel? I would give us a qualitative, uh, a qualitative ranking. Unlike uh, revenue, which has a number, uh, okay, this is well, more that, of a qualitative that, journey. 
That's a really interesting one, which is that you mentioned revenue there. How do you as a CPO think about products which generate revenue today, which is very important, um, but also versus the challenge of investing in innovative products for the future with unknown upside and untangible value creation? How do you balance those two? Yeah, so ideally, you know, everything we do starts from how it letters up to our vision. And this is something that I cannot emphasize enough. Like it's it's a incredible part of how we think of LinkedIn. We literally start our sessions and our planning process for what's the vision for the company. But then that translates usually to a strategic plan that spans between one to three years. And that plan usually has very specific goals for where do we want to drive revenue generating, you know, in the from an annual perspective, like let's call it the short-term annual perspective. And what's the long-term innovative products we're trying to build? And that plan usually encompasses of both. Um, so for us, like it's the combination of both the annual plan that used to basically has a revenue target on it, all the way to the long-term innovative products that we basically have there. Now, that said, we operate in a very competitive, fast-pacing environment. So it's not like we have a three-year plan, quarterly plan, and we go and execute. We do continuous planning. Like we do... Who as soon as strategies who, evolve, we basically run it. Who are your competitors? Well, you take every one of our job to be done and we can walk through it. So if you come to LinkedIn, you can think of LinkedIn as a productivity tool, really, ultimately. And it really helps you progress on the professional jobs to be done you're trying to make for your career. So if you're trying to find a job, there's many sites out there that can show you a job. If you're trying to... Uh, passively be recruited, then LinkedIn is a pretty unique product, right? When, when, so, when somebody's reaching out to you, but this is more about uh, recruiters reaching out than you actually engaging with it. If you're trying to market to someone, then there's multiple marketing tools you can do. There's multiple advertising tools you can use. If you're trying to build a brand, uh, there's multiple tools you can use to build a brand. LinkedIn is that tends to be a professional aspect of it, but you can still build. Uh, your brain in multiple ways. So it really depends on your job to be done. But as a professional community, LinkedIn is very unique. Do you worry about product marketing? And what I mean by that is when you are everything to everyone, it's a challenge and you can be nothing to no one (laughs) Uh, when you are that broad. And like sometimes also you have a grandiose vision like Stripe increasing the GDP of the internet. Sounds great. But guess what? It means fuck all to that SMB who just needs to make 10% more money so they can buy that coffee machine. The GDP of the internet, intellectual, too much. Like, do you worry sometimes that LinkedIn, at the scale and incumbent size you are, you almost lose product messaging touch with, fuck, I actually just need another client as a freelancer? It's it's a wonderful point. And one that uh, kind of touches on why in product jams, we emphasize the job to be done you're trying to hire for, you're trying to do for. So for example, even if you're solving, you're saying, even if, for example, you selected the job to be done for a job seeker, there's so many jobs to be done for a job seeker. You could be building you know, a job seeking experience for people who are looking for hourly work. You're trying to find a job for people who are you know, playing more in degrees, you know, they're more uh, professional hires in the market itself. You're trying to find jobs for uh, what we call first-line hires or people out of school who are trying to find for the same, for the same job. So for me, being able to talk specifically, not just on the audience and the overall arching um, value proposition you're trying to deliver for them, but going very narrow to the problem you're trying to solve is key. When you have that, then you're not trying to solve for everybody. You have very specific jobs to be done you're solving for, for people. A very specific audiences you're solving for people. Now, it all that is up to the vision. So after a while, once you think you've done a good job with that job to be done, you can move to the next level. So for example, at LinkedIn, one of our fastest growing segments are Gen Zs and entry-level professionals. So knowing that Gen Zs is going to be the future of the workforce, being able to think of what does Gen Zs care about when it comes to selecting a job? How do I do a great match? for a Gen Z when they think about the first job out of school. That becomes very specific. It totally does. I'm just thinking it through. Uh, my, what, I, what I also think through when I think of that is 
shit, AI fundamentally fucking changes how we build products. Do you as a product leader need to fundamentally change how you lead product teams and product organizations with AI moving faster than ever, as we touched on when we chatted before? Yeah, this is something which is dear and new to my heart because I've been working uh, on AI with AI for many, many years. And uh, same as we had the mobile revolution happening um, kind of 15 years ago and how we changed dramatically how we build and how we use products, AI is going to be much larger. In fact, I think every tech revolution has dramatically changed the way we build and how we think about products, you know, from the PCs in the 70s, the internet in the 90s, you had mobile in the first decade of the 21st century. And AI is going to be the biggest one we ever experience. Uh, and if you're building product today, I have this analogy that when you have a rear rafting boat, you have the guide on the boat sitting on the back, and that guide usually has two big pedals. And those pedals pretty much navigate the boat. They pretty much dictate success or failure for your product. And those pedals for me are AI. And that guide better be you as the product leader. So if you lead products in your company, you have to have the knowledge and skill set to know how to use AI, how to use those pedals to navigate your team and your company towards success. So it's a critical fundamental change right now. What do you do then if you don't? Because I think honestly, 90% do not. And I'm not blaming them. It, it, it hasn't been part of the core. So what do you do if you're not then? So I think it's been part of the core, but in the background. So AI has been a matchmaker of so many products. In fact, a lot of what you see on LinkedIn is powered by AI. When you open a bank account, it's powered by AI. Your pizza delivery to an extent is powered by AI. You just don't see it. But it is moving to the front, and that makes it a lot more visible, a lot more powerful. Uh, so the most important thing is learn. Learn about this technology. Learn how to adapt it. Learn how to use it. Learn its limitations. It has a lot of limitations. Learn how to implement it. It has to start from the business leader, from the product leaders, modeling how to use this technology and how to interact with it. We we're talking about the LinkedIn feed before. And, you know, the early parts of LinkedIn, uh, we assembled the feed team for the first time. And I noticed that the AI team was not part of the, link, the, the feed team because the AI team was a horizontal team at LinkedIn. And for me, you know, the most important part about the feed is what gets ranked. That's ultimately, you know, the core of the experience is how you rank uh, the, the updates for, for the member. Uh, so for me, it was, I lead the feed team, but it's almost like I, I'm in charge responsible of building a car, but the engine is being built by somebody else and I don't have any say into the engine. So the first thing we did was to build one team that encompasses of all parts of the experience from AI to the user interface. And that made a massive difference. And then I spent the vast majority of my time going very deep, going deep about the algorithm's objectives and how we refine it to be higher quality, uh, going deep, cleaning data. I spent weeks of my life, in my life cleaning data, data samples to showcase AI, how to train well, because if you train AI on garbage, it will produce garbage out. There's a saying in AI, garbage in, garbage out. But if you train on quality, it will produce high quality results. And that's, that's in my opinion, the responsibility of the product leader. So uh, the idea of really learning, but kind of rolling up your sleeves and going deep and interacting with this technology and understanding all the nuances of it are really critical right now. And there's, there's no way around it. You just have to learn it. What do you need to unlearn? What are the bad habits that you need to forget as we embrace it? Oh, I love that question. Because uh, I remember when we had the mobile revolution, uh, it was really hard for product leaders because they had a desktop first mindset. Yeah. You know, desktop first mindset had a lot of, you were trying to hedge with different modules and uh, it was above the fold, below the fold, the top right section and stuff like that. And mobile really forced you to say, there's only one thing that you can show on the screen. What is it? Uh, you have access to the camera. You have access to location. What do you? How do you rethink that in a mobile first way? And you had to unlearn. I think every tech revolution requires you to unlearn so you can learn again with that kind of beginner's mindset. There's a lot of things when it comes to AI where you have to need to unlearn uh, and relearn again. You know, the 
for me, one of the biggest ones, and this is where I usually see the hardest mindset shift for product people, is that with AI, you don't control the experience. AI is not deterministic. If you ever had an interaction in ChatGPT, it's, you know, you're most of the time you're trying to hard to anticipate how it would respond. And I give the analogy of a chef in a restaurant where before, imagine as the product leader, you were the chef of the restaurant, you dictated every part of the experience from the music, the ambience, the ingredients, how the plating is done, the, the flavors, uh, the amount of salt. And now with AI, it's as if you're giving the ingredients you're giving the guidelines, the philosophy, the principles, but the AI really learns on itself how to build a great, you can always refine and help it understand, but it learns on itself. So you kind of have to forego some of that control, trusting you can build a much better experience with AI and how you do it. We spoke about enterprise buying beforehand. I think enterprises are inherently ignorant and lazier than we give them credit for. Um, and they like simple solutions, especially in Europe. Um, so when we think about that, I think we enter a world of bundled AI products, especially from the next three to five years. It may be seven out of 10, but it comes in a nice open AI wrapper. We know open AI, that's a famous brand, right? And it all comes under one umbrella versus a world of unbundled, many models, a bit more customization, probably better products, but more tailoring and tinkering needed. Do you think we are entering a world of enterprise bundled preferences on AI products? You know, there's a great saying in technology that if you look back, you'll see technology as an evolution of bundling and unbundling. And I do yeah. think we are potentially seeing the next bundling uh, transformational wave. For me, it's really comes down to the role that AI can play in taking a lot of what was drudgery um, tasks, automating them, and you'll be able to combine roles together. So if you needed multiple products, multiple roles before to create certain experiences, and a lot of it was just, you know, roles that could be automated. There were drudgery, there were it's the, you know, the work you do that you would rather give a machine. You would rather have a machine do so you can focus on the creative work, the more managerial work of it. With AI, you can do that today. You can have that master brain working across multiple interfaces, multiple products with the same objective you have in mind. So we are, in my opinion, going into a transformation of bundling. When you'll see better uh, more efficient experiences done by one centralized brain, which is the AI model itself. And in fact, right now already, um, OpenAI showed how by adding multiple services that OpenAI connects with, you can go all the way from, I want to have a, you know, I'll give you a consumer experience. I want to uh, do a dinner party with my friends. And I, you know, I'm thinking about recipes. Give me a great recipe but take it all the way to run it through my Instacart and make the order and ship the ingredients to me. Like the whole flow is being done by AI. And what used to be five, six distinct subtasks is now one request, one prompt that is being automated by AI. In enterprise, there's so many workflows and a lot of, it, a lot of them can be automated. In fact, some of the most complex experiences can be automated right now because you have this intelligent brain working on top of all of them. Toma, do you and the team use Copilot? We do. How, I, I've how been using this technology all the time. It's incredible. Yeah. I had dinner last night with two of our founders and they said they're now 50% more productive. And my question to you is, if we think about now, GitHub published 41% of new code creators, AI code creation. What is that in five years? Wow. Um Five years is a long time. In the we're we're in a pace right now where we are. Have we ever seen pace like this ever? No. Not in my lifetime. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're accelerating to. I, I can give an example. I've been teaching how to build with an AI first mindset for many years, and I've been teaching about I was talking about open AI and transformer technology. And, and I was now, talking about now it's now coming. It's sexy, Toma. It's sexy now, baby. <laughs> yeah, now people listen. Uh, but I, it was, it surprised me how fast. And 
in fact, when you think about what's coming, I think we're all going to be shocked by how more and more invest, more and more capable, uh, because you are setting new baselines that allow for a lot more innovation. You know, you think about all the constraints of AI today, algorithms investment, computing power, allowing for more information to flow in and out in the, in the form of tokens, those will all be alleviated. And when those are all alleviated, you can build faster and better and more accurate. You can allow for more creativity. So that five-year horizon is, is almost like far too long. I'd uh, rather like focus on, on the next year horizon. Man, but I think we're going to see massive amount of productivity coming out. And you know what's for, uh, there's a brilliant quote we've mentioned some great quotes the big quote that i always think about is will the incumbent acquire innovation before the startup acquires distribution brilliant quote the really interesting thing now is i think incumbents are innovating so well with ai you look at microsoft you look at adobe and how adobe are integrating into core products and product suites I think for the first time they're really, and so my question is, where do you think value accrues in the next wave of AI? Do you think it is actually incumbents or do you think it's startups? Where is that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great point. And I think we're, we're, we'll see very soon how it shapes up. Uh, and it's going to be a continuous evolution in my opinion, because to our to point before, this is going to be accelerated pace. So every tech revolution brings with it new winners and new losers. This one is no different. In fact, I think this one, opens uh, uh, the window for many uh, startups to actually start playing with ingenuity and innovation. Uh, to your point, I'm sure many incumbents today have learned the mistakes of the past and they're racing to innovate with this technology. However, they do tend to be locked to their way of thinking. And I think that's an opportunity for startups. So let's start with the classic you know, dimensions that usually incumbents um, uh, have a, you know, a leg up with. They have access to resources, this requires compute, this requires capital, this requires infrastructure, requires talent. So if you're an incumbent and you already have the infrastructure for AI, the talent for AI, you, you already have a leg up in this race and you should be using that. Incumbents have existing market share. They have already an existing customer base uh, and that customer is expecting them to start leading with AI. So they're potentially racing to that. They usually have a data advantage they have some proprietary data that is unique to them, so they can build with that. But, and that's a big but, because I do think this is the biggest unique advantage of startups is startups can be extremely innovative right now. I think you take every problem that existed before, every job to be done, and you can go back to the drawing board and rethink it. And, and Harry, this is not just in tech, like right, this could be healthcare, retail, fashion, entertainment, supply chain, education. But we can go industry by industry and think about the transformation that this technology can do. And I think we're going to have a moment of being mind blown because you're really going back to the drawing board. Do you, do you not agree though? So I was with a company this morning and they were like, you know, well, you know, we're going to sit on top of uh, open AI and chat GPT and we're going to provide this additional slice and say it's in healthcare. So we're going to provide this addition. That doesn't doesn't work the ones who actually work is when you've got five years of healthcare data that you can you know bluntly utilize the models on where it then is actually 30 percent open ai or 40 percent whatever it is and 60 percent new but this thin layer of i'm seeing so many sales tools onboarding tools human or other i don't think value accrues into onto that and so i'm like where does value accrue then in this wave that you mentioned i'm an investor yeah Help so me if you so if you ask me uh, a couple of years ago, I would have told you that data is everything in AI, right? Because computing power is accessible and, uh, and the models are accessible to all, they're open source. So it's really about the data you have. And, and there was, a, you know, people coined data as the new oil. And there was a reason for that. Data was the fuel that helped AI become better. And then the more data you had, the better products you can build. The better products you have, the more users you have, the more data you have, and you have this virtuous cycle of success. It was also vicious cycles for startups. The startup has to innovate around how they would get data. And there's ways to do that as well, by the way. Some very amazing, scrappy startups were able to bring data in a very innovative way that helped them compete. Now, what's happening right now is, you know, technologies like GPT are already trained on all public data. They've read every book, 
every healthcare book, they've trained on every piece of literature, art, best practices. This is, the whole idea of the whole pre-train is one of the biggest inflection points in this technology. It's already trained on every available public information out there. So the data advantage that used to exist a couple of years ago, I think is getting diminished, but not to a full extent, because to your point, you can still bring your own proprietary data. The question is how proprietary it is. I, how is it getting diminished? If you look at, say, Trip Actions or Navan, they have seven years of travel and expense management data, which is not a public resource, generally speaking, if it's high quality and rich in data sources. If it is, it's probably shit. So I, how is that not proprietary still? How is that pre-trained already? Like They still have as just as strong as ever, no? Yeah, private information is still proprietary to you. So if you have proprietary information that is truly unique, yeah. You truly have an edge. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but before, you had no access to the vast amount of information. So like now, everybody has a similar baseline. And that's I think that does take away the... If data before was the ultimate oil, it still has power. It's still important. Yeah. But it no longer has the same power as it has before. Now, when you have a part of information you can start building your own unique application. So if it's healthcare and you have healthcare data, as an example, you can, buy, you can build really unique specialized tools. So the example I give is GPT is, an, is a generalized, it's a, general, you know, it's a generalist. It's almost like you hire a generalist to your VC. They can do a lot of things. It's almost like you bring an athlete, but then you can start training that athlete to be a weightlifter. Athlete could be a long, long distance runner. And, uh, and then you specialize that athlete to be very, very, very specific with your own data, your own tool, you can build something unique. That process is called fine tuning. That process is also expensive. So when you start fine tuning, you have to build your own instance of this model, bring your own data that requires computing power. And that by itself is a process. So there is a, an opportunity right now for startups to actually go and innovate. Do we need to restructure the fundamentals of our teams for these new processes? So when we think about moving to these instance creations, and when we think about fine tuning our data on pre-trained models, but we're using our data, do we need scientists in our team? Do we need a completely different structure for how we build and develop products? I think you need new skill sets in your team, for sure. Um, you need people who are working very closely with this technology. I think AI talent is going to be one of the most important talents to have in every company. Uh, people who intimately understand how this works and can operate this technology. So one of the most important interfaces is the prompts, right? The, what people use in ChatGPT as a fun way to write prompts. That's yeah. actually a really critical interface. That's the interface between the machine and the human. And being able to understand how you do, this is how you talk to AI. And prompt by itself is a masterful skill today. If you master the work of, by the way, that's a, the best practices playbook is still being written because in many ways, we're still almost like reverse engineering how this technology works. Uh, but the skill of understanding how to talk to AI, to your point, how to build my fine-tuned data into the process how to leverage it in, in, in the direction of building amazing processes is an extraordinary skill. I've been playing with, uh, with prompts for a long time. And, you know, the examples I give, which is just a fun example, I can ask AI, explain quantum physics for me. And it will explain it and it will be an okay explanation, you know, very much a Wikipedia kind of like explanation. But then I can say, hey, explain to me quantum physics as if you're a PBS. PBS is the educational channel here in the in, in the US, as if you're like a PBS style teacher explaining to a 10 year old and you're, you love physics, you want my kid to fall in love with physics. And my, you know, my kids love games. How would you explain quantum physics and make it fun, give examples. And then AI would give you this incredible, incredible way of explaining quantum physics. I did it. It explained it to me in the form of hide and seek that it can hide in both places and it could appear in both places. That was like mind blowing explanation. Different prompt, but in a whole different answer, but the same objective in many ways. So the ability for you to understand how this works and interact with it is really, really powerful. 
Another thing would be a differentiator for companies and interactions. I'm throwing you in the deep end here. I'm going to get you in trouble with comms, Toma, but LinkedIn is a publishing engine as well. I publish to LinkedIn my posts. Many people publish amazing content to LinkedIn. OpenAI and ChatGPT and many of these models will be scraping and extracting your content and your value, paying you nothing. How do you think this looks for content publishers moving forwards? What's the, what's the thoughts there? Yeah, I think LinkedIn is a platform uh, that allows people to exchange information. In many ways, we actually open up um, discovery for information being shared on LinkedIn because it's a great way for creators to be able to be discovered outside of LinkedIn and then uh, they can build the reputation on LinkedIn and being know they can be discovered everywhere. I do think, though, you know, there's the, the question around the role this technology is playing with publications in general. Like if now I can get an answer for this tool, do I need to go all the way to the site to engage with it? And I think that uh, that evolution was still being developed and built. I think we had the same thing with search to an extent where if I can get the answer for search, do I have to go all the way to the site and actually get the response in the site? Well, no, but if you think of search as a reader, right? Search, if I search, you know, Toma Cohen LinkedIn or, you know, uh, CPO LinkedIn, it takes me to your page on LinkedIn and then you retain me. You have the chance for me to follow someone else or follow someone else. Here, I can go, who's the CPO at LinkedIn? What was their background before? LinkedIn never gets my visit. Yeah. And I think that will uh, potentially start changing the interaction model. The LinkedIn profile is, there's the public side of it, but there's also the private elements of it. So knowing who Tomer Coin is, what's their title, I think that can appear um, uh, in the experience itself. But this is where you start playing into at what level is every information of every company appearing in this model? And it's not. There is some specific... Um, you know, there's some specific like lines around what what is accessible and what is not. But you do expect this technology to start playing a much bigger role in interactions. So, for example, when Bing launched their uh, experience with Copilot, it gives a lot of um, annotations to where the information came from and reference back. So you can actually get the information back and it starts to highlight a lot of the value of those platforms. I think we're still at the early innings on it, so we can see how this develops. But I do think it poses the question of where is the internet evolving towards in terms of information discovery and then information, in a way, business models that are going to appear as part of this one. You said very early there in terms of where we are. I just have to ask you, Elon said, we cannot let it out of the bottle because unlike most technologies before, you can put you, you can put most of them back in the bottle. You won't be able to revert this progression. Do you agree with him? And how do you think regulation looks for AI moving forwards? I think when you think about this technology, uh, your spectrum for me you know, lies from high excitement to concern as well, because it is like with any powerful technology, it could be used to do amazing things and as an amazing productivity tool, and it could also be used as a weapon. Uh, so the, the the notion of being extremely responsible with how this technology is being used, especially for the ones building it, uh, I could not agree with more. It's it's how it's how I think we build and how we interact. Uh, the, we know we've been investing for a while now, even long before this technology, in what we call responsible AI principles, which is how you build with transparency how you build with inclusivity, how you build with privacy. You make sure it's built into the models, it's built into the interaction, and you don't release something to the public unless those principles are being met. Should models be trained to be politically correct? Models should do their best to provide the most accurate answer to your, um, to your flow. If you're trying to have a buddy experience, then that's a very different product you're building. But if you're trying to access information, the models should try to be as factual and objective as possible. And I think that kind of puts aside the notion of being politically correct. Now, everybody will have access to this technology. Everybody has access to it right now, so they can build whatever product they're trying to do. But models are, in general, they're just construct of technology. The question should be, should the applications be done in a certain way. And that's really up to what are you trying to achieve? 
like like for example, when you operate on LinkedIn, we uh, we build with the context of like in conversations on LinkedIn are trusted, they're safe, they're professional. And so every interaction, every model you'll see on LinkedIn would be professional and and trusted and safe. That's just the LinkedIn experience. Uh, so that's what you'd expect from us. What would every developer build with this? That's really up to them. But the models ideally are as accurate and focused on information as possible. What do you think are the big questions that people are not asking? You've been you know, deep in AI for many years. You see the questions that I'm asking. You see the questions that other people are asking. What are you going, Harry, I don't know why no one's getting this. Yeah, so those current models right now, uh, this is very like towards the future. So this is your five plus year question. Great. Those models right now are, are very focused on existing knowledge, right? So they learned all available public knowledge in the internet. And they have com incredible comprehension and generative skills. And they'll be able to produce a result for you that is trying to predict what you're trying to answer. But then there's the question of what about new knowledge? What happens when those models start to hypothesize? They can come up with new ideas, new scientific discoveries. You know, imagine AI coming up with answers to some of the biggest scientific mysteries in the world, like... What is dark matter? What's dark energy? What causes Alzheimer's disease? What is quantum mechanics? What is oneself? And that for me is you're moving from a place of those models are amazing in rebuilding and restructuring existing knowledge to coming up with new knowledge. When you start to come up with new knowledge, you're really talking about a whole new frontier not just for business and the economy, but for society as a whole. Is net new knowledge not AGI? Is that not the ability to deal with ambiguity, the ability to make subjective decisions? Just, I'm, I'm purely asking, I'm not like posturing, I'm, I'm genuinely intrigued. Yeah, I'm hoping you're going to ask me to define AGI uh, because that's a really hard task right now. But, <laughs> but in a way, it is. In a way, you're trying to build as close to human intelligence as possible. And human intelligence, you know, going back to our conversation about art and science, like the ability to be imaginative, to hypothesize, to have a vision, that's what makes us, that's what makes us, you know, naturally human. That's our, that's our skill set. And it's not the day-to-day -day judgery that makes us human. It's the imaginative side of our world that makes us human and, and extremely powerful. So there is a point where you start asking if this when this technology reaches that level, what is next? And then, and then it's not just going back to the drawing board. It's like, I don't know if there's a drawing board. Like you almost go back to rethinking what, what is the role of this technology and how do we really start interacting? The human and machine interaction is elevated to a whole new level that I don't think we have experienced before. Now, here's the part. I think society has yet to adapt. Even think about self-driving cars. We're still playing with the idea of self-driving cars. What about a self-driving doctor, a self-driving psychologist? You know, imagine this technology being able to be so intimate with you. It could access your phone, your computer, your photo, obviously with your permissions. It could read your voicemail. Every piece of digital footprint you have, you know, you and I can start building some great science fiction movies as a result of that. But is it science fiction? There's a great saying that I really like that, the, you know, the difference between science fiction and nonfiction is just a matter of time. And I think we're kind of entering that phase of uh, science fiction being a reality. Tommy, you have children. Do you kind of feel a bit ridiculous sending them off to school every day? And I don't mean that rudely, but I just mean in like the decay rate of education. It's like by the time they'll be like functioning adults in a workplace, I don't know how old they are, but say it's 10 to 15 years. I mean, fuck. <laughs> like, you know, what, what, what they're learning today is pretty useless, huh? I think the only skill, the most important skill outside of being a good human being and a kind human being, but from a, uh, from a what do you learn to be successful? The only skill that matters, I think, is growth mindset. It's the ability for you to learn, to continuously evolve. 
I think we're moving to a place of, you know, you're already at a pace of accelerated um, uh, technology. Like if you look at the skill set you needed for a job today versus five years ago, that has changed by 25%. So a quarter of the skill set that we required five years ago no longer, they're different right now. You look at it five years ahead, they're going to be 50% different. And we all, we all know they're going to accelerate and accelerate over time. So then you go back to, is it learning a specific skill? Should you learn coding? You know, what should you learn? And it's really, for me, it's, you should learn how to learn. You should learn how to pick up new dimensions and new material uh, and new areas as fast as possible and being able to immerse yourself with it. I think that's the most important, at least for me in my household, and, you know, growth mindset is like our second religion at home. It's the most important thing we invest in. I thought the same, and then I did a comparative analysis of property management markets in Germany with the core incumbents, their profit margins, and then who are the biggest uh, like up, upstarts competing with them. And I got it back by ChatGPT in about six seconds. And I was like, well, that saved the learning process. <laughs> I just read that one. Um, so, so yes, I, I, I totally get you. Final, final one, I promise, and then I'll do a quick fire. Is it a world of one model or is it a world of many models and much more complexity but tailorization? I think it's a, we are now in a phase of like foundational models. So the foundational model sets the baseline for all other models to build on top of it. So you'll see a lot of applications and new models. There is now like auto GPT that takes the GPT-4 and builds uh, kind of an overarching um, kind of a objective function above it that kind of breaks it down to multiple subtasks. So I think we're now at the phase of foundational models and you'll see a lot more applications build as a result of that on top of it. Uh, and then gradually we'll see more and more foundational models in the future. So you're going to start, you know, back to the notion around bundling and unbundling. I think we're now in the version of like unbundling to multiple versions until we see another foundational model in the future. Do you know what I love about this chat, Toma, is like when we started talking about AI and suddenly both of us were like, boom, come alive. <laughs> it's great. It's so, I love no, it when you have... This is why I love doing what I do. Like the conversations you have are just special. So I want to do a quick fire round and then I'm going to let you go. So I say a short yeah. statement. You give me your immediate thoughts. What is your favorite interview question when hiring for product? I like asking two questions. Uh, that's kind of my stable, my, my kind of table stakes questions usually. One is what's the most complex problem you worked on and how did you do it? And what you're trying to understand there is what was your job to be done inside? How clear you are around explaining a complex problem? How nuanced can you get? Uh, how profound, and how much of a profound understanding did you bring to it? And I enjoy going deep. I really enjoy going deep with, uh, with candidates. The other one is a growth mindset question. I'm looking for areas where you did not succeed, where you failed, and understanding how you dealt with that. How did you deal with failure? And I'm looking for learnings. And the best responses I get is I've learned so much and here's how I've done differently. And, and it's, not, um, it's not about retroactively trying to fix anything. It's more about seeing that there is a, an evolving mindset there of trying to do things better and better and evolving over time. Those are kind of my two main questions I ask in every interview. What product release are you most proud of and what are you most embarrassed of? You know, I, I heard an artist recently talk about, a musician talk about their career in albums. And I thought hmm. it would be pretty cool to think about the product, your product career in releases kind of thing. Releases that were, you know, releases that kind of uh, mattered and, and, and made a, a significant uh, impact. Uh, there's, there's multiples for me. Um, we talked about the feed before and how transformational it was. Transforming LinkedIn into a mobile company was an incredible moment uh, to rethink, you know, originally LinkedIn was a desktop first company. It had so many like desktop experience. I think we had hundreds and hundreds of pages on desktop. And here we are launching LinkedIn from scratch again with like, you know, 20 pages, 20 experiences, like 20 uh, kind of uh, experiences with a very kind of tight and focused information architecture. That was a big, bold move, and I really enjoyed that. 
with the feed, we talked about how we shifted towards feed, more knowledge and economic opportunity in creation. I was really proud of how we dealt with COVID and how we rallied internally to meet the moment and help members where they need us the most. There's so many moments I'm proud of. And, you know, looking back, even the ones that did not succeed, we learned so much. I've, I've grown so much from those. Which one are you and embarrassed Even of? those I'm actually pretty proud of. Which one are you most embarrassed? I'm not embarrassed of anyone. Uh, I'm not embarrassed of anybody because I've learned a lot from, but there's many that I've done that did not succeed. You know, I've done one early on. I tried to launch what's called instant articles. This was early mobile days. Every, you know, um, article you clicked on on LinkedIn took you five to seven seconds to load. It was a horrible experience. And I was like, I can solve this. I can build and, you know, I can cache all the information. When you come in, I'll be a great example, a great experience to showcase it to uh, users from publishers. We got publishers to work with us. And it was a really tough one because ultimately we did, was able to load it really fast and it was a much simpler experience, but there were so many nuances to how publishers wanted to experience to show up. And we ended up thinking, oh, this is an enterprise tool and we're building a consumer product. We have to simplify this dramatically. I've learned a lot about the different nuances of, uh, of how you build different custom, build experiences for publishers, but we were, and we were way ahead of the market in that one. The timing was not there as well. But the hypothesis what, was solid, but the, the execution was not. What's the biggest piece of advice you give to a new product leader joining an organization today? What do you wish you'd known when you, the night before you became CPO of LinkedIn for the first time? I think when somebody joins a PM at LinkedIn and they usually ask me, like, what's, my, what's the best way for me to be successful? Uh, the biggest piece of advice I tell them is, you know, if you just focus on your area, there is a chance that you'll be linear successful and you can move your area forward and can hit your targets. But really your ability to be exponentially successful at LinkedIn is really learning how LinkedIn works. LinkedIn is a beautifully complex ecosystem. We have a consumer platform that caters to 900 million members, 60 million companies on LinkedIn, almost every job and skill in the world on LinkedIn, Almost every piece of professional knowledge and information is on LinkedIn. Now, with that ability, how can you build something that is truly unique, is truly innovative? But don't just think about your swim lanes and what you're trying to do. Think more holistically about the experience that you can bring into it. Some of the best experiences on LinkedIn, they cross across the entire ecosystem, across multiple products to build something which is really unique. And that's where I would love to see innovation come through, not how I innovate within my specific area or my feature. Penultimate one for you, my friend. I've, I, I hear you're an intermittent faster. What's the biggest advice to someone considering <laughs> intermittent fasting? I don't know where you got that from, but it's correct. Uh, give it a few weeks. It takes time. I think the beginning is hard. I used to, uh, you know, my, my most favorite meal is breakfast and mm. giving it away was was not easy. How long do you fast for? I do everything between 18.6 to 24. Uh, 20 hours 20 hours fasting, 4 hours eating, or 18 hours uh, fasting, 6 hours eating. Do you not find it impacts your brain activity and your mood? For me, my brain activity goes down and my mood goes down. No? How, how long did you try it? Probably three days a week for a month. So not every day, but like Monday, um, Wednesday, Friday for a month. So when I started, 100%. And, I, and uh, you know, I run and I used to run long runs and I used to think about, oh, I have to eat before the run, if the, after the run. I can fast for a whole day with a long run and not feel anything right now because your body learns to produce the sugar you need, the energy you need, the glucose you need in a different way. So um, I would methodically try to give it a few again i'm not a doctor this is not a doctor's yeah. opinion uh but i've found it to be extremely powerful for me and in fact i'm i'm sharper um when uh during my my fast than when i eat um so it's actually it elevated my physical abilities and my mental capabilities again sample of one and there's some pretty good research by now i can send you uh, a great peer review uh, about intermittent fasting that is is by now uh, legit and scientific. 
Toma, that was fantastic. Listen, sample of one. There's a brilliant peer review, though, that's got many samples. That was a brilliant parrot. I told, I loved it. No, no, sample of one of my, my, my own emotional experience, but there is, there is specific science around intermittent fasting and yeah. the ability for it to both improve your health span uh, and your longevity. Listen, I could talk to you all day. I didn't know you're a runner as well. So like, fuck, we're in for a long session. Um, my final one for you, though, is what's the most recent company product strategy that you've been most impressed by? So this is a very easy one, but I'm obviously very subjective. So you have to excuse me on this one. I've been very impressed with what uh, Satya and Microsoft has done with the OpenAI integration. It's just hard to look at it and not uh, be impressed by the strategy, the execution, uh, the impact uh, I've been able to see it firsthand, be part of it firsthand, and I know what's about to come, and I'm extremely bullish about it. But being able to really think through a groundbreaking technology, think through the execution of taking it to market in a responsible way, thinking through the elements of all the way from cloud impact to productivity to end user. For me, that's one of the, one of the most impressive product strategies I've seen in a long time. Plus execution, been remarkable to see and be part of it. Elon said at this point, Satya and Microsoft basically control OpenAI. Is that fair? Microsoft is a partial owner in, in OpenAI, but OpenAI is an independent company. I've loved this, man. This has been so much fun. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me, Toma. You've been amazingly uh, uh, resilient to my questions. So you've been a star and I really appreciate it. Of course, this was awesome. Thank you so much.